Welcome back, everyone. Oh, I'm a little dark. Oh, that's a little better. Um, I've devoted the last part of this lecture to discussing a little bit on aging and a little bit on dementia. Uh, not too much, but a little bit. Um, some of the aspects of this are not going to be in your textbook. They're, it's just a byproduct of your teacher is a geropsychologist, and this is interesting to him. Um, so just pay attention to the lecture. Some of the information in the lecture will be that's not in the book will be on the test, but um, it's not going to be overly specific either. It's just I want you to have an idea of what these disorders are like and um, and what you can do about them. The testing that's really important, things of that nature. So. I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear that cognition changes with time. Some of these changes are normal, some of them are abnormal. In fact, for humans, brain weight starts to decline significantly after age 45. So this actually happens pretty early. The first sign of cognitive change that we often see is a decrease in processing speed. However, these are not usually that apparent because while processing speed slows, there are also benefits from experience that can make up for the deficit. However, aging adults may not feel that they are as sharp as they used to be, and it may take them a little bit longer to figure out the same answers that used to come effortlessly. There are also some normal declines in memory with age. As we age, there's a decrease in volume in the hippocampus, which is the structure important for encoding memories. Due to this, we see a decline in delayed memory, but not immediate memory. Why might this be? Well, immediate memory relies a lot more on attention, and attention is mediated by the hippocampus. In fact, you can have, um, even HM had a brief memory um, that was maintained by attention. So with that, immediate memory is attention, but the delayed memory, so if I test you on something even 10 or 15 minutes later, that's something that requires memory encoding, unless I'm letting you rehearse it. So that's one reason you see that difference. So sometimes the memory or cognitive problems are a bit more severe than normal aging, but it's not enough to interfere with daily life. The memory loss is covered by, this memory loss is covered by the diagnosis mild cognitive impairment, which is actually one of the most controversial diagnoses in the DSM. It's thought, it at least was hypothesized to be, a transitional stage between normal aging and dementia. And due to this, um, it's due to the this belief, it's a misunderstanding really, many people with MCI believe that they have dementia. However, one of the reasons why it's controversial is only about 10 to 15 percent of those with MCI will convert to Alzheimer's disease each year, and many never do. So it's not a natural progression. Just because you have MSI does not mean you'll ever develop dementia. Some do, um, but also some have questioned whether or not the diagnosis does more harm than good because people will misunderstand it occasionally and think they have dementia when they really don't. So what is dementia? Dementia is defined as a drastic failure of cognitive ability, including memory failure and loss of orientation. The most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's dementia. It can appear in middle age, often called early onset Alzheimer's, but it's usually manifest in late life. The risk of Alzheimer's disease increases exponentially with age, which has led some to conclude that if you live long enough, you'll eventually develop it. The book disagrees on this, um, and actually I destroyed the book, um, but what I will say is my assertion on this is based upon newer research. <laughs> but you can check out the literature for yourself and decide. But um, you see drastic increases in the prevalence of Alzheimer's as we get into our 80s, 90s. You know, as we age, you just see it, it blows up in prevalence. So early stage Alzheimer's looks a lot like normal aging. 
uh, you have pre difficulty remembering recent events, um, maybe some confusion, especially as time goes on, you see more confusion, irritability and aggression, mood swings, language problems, and long-term memory loss can develop. There are also significant problems with inhibitions, which is why um, individuals with Alzheimer's may appear like they're losing their verbal filter. Um, this is something I saw all the time when I worked at the psychiatric nursing home. Um, people would always wonder, why does grandma say these horrible things? Well, it's because they're the things that, you know, may pop in our head. You know, the things that you think, but you don't say. That filter's gone often in Alzheimer's. So those things that just pop in your head, you actually say. And so it's difficult because um, you, have di you have changes in... Um, you have changes in personality, and you also have these, um, the lack of the verbal filter. So people can often seem very different um, with dementia, especially Alzheimer's. We don't fully understand the cause of Alzheimer's, but there does seem to be a relation with the development of uh, neurofibrillary uh, tangles and amyloid plaques that choked off the brain cells and caused neuronal death. These plaques and tangles cause the neurons in the basal forebrain to stop producing acetylcholine, which appears to be a large cause for the deficits we see in Alzheimer's. To help relieve these effects, drugs like Aricept, which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. By, as you can guess from this, it blocks acetylcholinesterase, which is the enzyme that deactivates acetylcholine. It doesn't cure Alzheimer's, and the disease still progresses, but it helps reduce the symptoms over a period of time. So now I have a 12-minute video for you on Alzheimer's that I think will give you a much better understanding. Some of you may already have some of this. You may live with a relative or know of a relative with Alzheimer's, but I think this will be helpful for those of you who haven't had a lot of experience with it. A flag, holding a flag that has 48 stars. Life is living in a constant search, looking for something that isn't there. This is how Patty describes life with dementia. Born an only child, in a few years she would become valedictorian of her high school, graduate magna cum laude from Syracuse University. Now, daily activities often leave her lost and confused. I walk down in the kitchen in the mornings, and I have to stand there and say, okay, you make your coffee. And the voice goes, how do you do that? I mean, really, I do that with everything. I mean, there were, when I first realized I was doing this, I would be turning around in the circle in my kitchen saying, uh, okay. And I didn't tell anybody I was doing this because I didn't want anybody to know. Generally, uh, patients with Alzheimer's or other dementia uh, don't recognize signs of the diseases themselves. It's re generally recognized by their families or their friends who notice that something isn't quite right. Uh, they're forgetting things. They're, they're just not behaving as they normally would. Things are slipping by them. And oftentimes, these are very subtle. It takes months to a couple of years before they really realize something is dreadfully wrong here. As it continues, it impairs everyday life. So eventually, people cannot take care of themselves. Dementia and the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, are largely associated with aging and are among the fastest growing and most devastating epidemics in the country. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease are diseases of the brain that affects memory, but can march on uh, either slowly or abruptly to involve other cognitive functions. Apple, table, penny. Can you repeat that, please? Apple, table, Such as planning, sequencing, naming, calculation, to the point that it affects someone's 
ability to function uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you say the truck rolled over the stone bridge? Okay, again. Okay, I'm going to take that. Okay, so. The truck rolled over. Loss of memory really defines the disease, and it also defines who we are as people. Without our memory, we have no past, we can't plan the future, and we can't appreciate the present. So I think many of us truly fear getting Alzheimer's disease because we fear losing who we are as people. The truck rolled over the stone bridge. Dementia is a remarkable disease. It, it spares nobody. Uh, it spares nobody regardless of, of race, gender, uh, and wealth, socioeconomic status, what you did in life. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease affects about 10-15% of people over the age of 65 and up to 50% of people over the age of 85. The people, uh, the Americans over the age of 85 is the fastest growing population a segment in our country. It's going to be an enormous problem be only because we are just at the beginning of the baby boom generation, the boomer generation turning 65. So if you fast forward that to 10, 20 years, you can see the magnitude of this problem. The statistics on Alzheimer's disease are alarming. Every 68 seconds, someone else is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Not only is it increasing in prevalence, but it's, it's probably our most costly health care condition and will continue to be so for, for many years until we have some corrective actions. It's, it's billions. I think if you took dementia as a, an industry, I think it's, it's bigger than Walmart. I would characterize this disease as the most important medical problem today. More than 5 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease, more than 30 million people worldwide and because the fastest growing segment in many populations is the elderly, uh, the expectation is that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease will triple in coming decades. When I started doing research, the cost of Alzheimer's disease care was around $100 billion a year. Now it's far over $200 billion a year. And again, by 2050, it's estimated to be more than $1.2 trillion a year. In fact, Alzheimer's disease, uh, which now has moved up from eighth or ninth leading cause of death to sixth leading cause of death, will bankrupt the world's economy. It will bankrupt the United States, it will bankrupt the European economies, it will bankrupt the Japanese economies. Any of these countries that have populations that can live long enough to get Alzheimer's disease, which is a disease of aging, will face these tremendous economic burdens. Just five years after leaving the White House, former President Ronald Reagan's diagnosis brought Alzheimer's directly into the spotlight. It was um, 1994 when my father was diagnosed, and um, people really weren't talking about Alzheimer's that much. It was like a well-kept secret. And uh, suddenly, overnight, everyone in the world knew that my father had Alzheimer's. I had to accept this is how I was going to lose him and I didn't know nobody could tell me how I mean nobody could tell me how it was how the disease was going to unfold or, or what was going to happen popular TV personality and entrepreneur Lisa Gibbons has spent years in front of the camera but few knew her personal story unfolding in recent years behind the scenes Alzheimer's I think is the cruelest sentence that can happen to a family. And it does happen to a family, like death in slow motion. So for our family, we felt like what millions of other families feel like. Um, we were really lost. Lisa's mother, who had been her lifelong inspiration and best friend, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. My mom's decline was over 10 years. I remember one of the first times that I had to come to terms with the fact that she didn't know me, which is, I think, the hardest moment for all caregivers. You know, how can you be so close and so important and share so much 
and look at this woman and there's just a vacant stare. I had gone home to help my mom in her house and we were making the bed. And mom looked up and she said, you are such a nice lady. Who are you again? And I took a moment to feel that awful hurt and that stab in my heart and then I knew it was the disease. It was not my mom. And I said, I'm your daughter. My name is Lisa and I'm always going to be here for you. It's a loss like no other um, because as this disease progresses and as people lose their memories, they also lose their relationships. And so family members talk about living with a stranger, living with someone who's no longer there anymore because that relationship is lost. The losses are staggering and they're often slow. Um, it's been termed a long goodbye. Um, the patient is slowly losing pieces of, of who they were. So it's a devastating disease for families and their loved ones. Um, a difficult aspect is that patients often have limited insight into their cognitive losses, their memory losses, so they may not understand the devastation and the losses that they have suffered where the family members see it and they feel it and they feel the loss of that loved one very deeply. Alzheimer's has a tremendous impact on the family. So first there is the disease itself that steals the patient away from the family. Their, their personality changes, they become a different person in, in many cases, they become forgetful, they need more help. So one effect is just the grief that the family goes through in seeing their loved one uh, disappear before their eyes. The toll is emotional, physical, and financial. Patty had plans to leave an inheritance for her son. I have a reverse mortgage, so they can't take my house away from me, they being the big monster I don't know. But uh, I mean, I could be drained of every bit of finances I had, and which would be his inheritance. That terrifies me. How, how can this happen? I've taken over many of the family responsibilities that I you know, didn't do before paying. I always paid bills, but now I do the taxes and things of that she nature. She does everything. <laughs> well, Rabbi Harry Roth cares for his wife Lillian, who has Alzheimer's, virtually every moment of the day. We was having lunch just a few minutes ago, and we looked up, and one of the women, whom I didn't recognize, so she must be a new resident here, was being wheeled out in a wheelchair, and above her head, there were three balloons which said one zero zero. She she turned a hundred years old today. There are people here that are a hundred over a hundred years old, and uh, the fear, the estimate, how many people are going to be suffering from Alzheimer's in ten years or twenty years, is is unbelievable. This year, the federal government declared war on Alzheimer's disease, releasing its first ever national Alzheimer's plan. The national plan. Um, is, is first and foremost, I think, about uh, putting the spotlight on this condition. And so focusing people in terms of their efforts and coming up with solutions. Uh, a, a big part of that plan is actually in investing in research. But there are other aspects of the plan that have to do with supporting health care and helping health care really reinvent itself. We're not ashamed or afraid to use the term Alzheimer's. No. And I oh, think so many people think it like a venereal disease. I, I can't understand that. Because if you demystify it, then people aren't perhaps going to be as afraid and they'll get help when they can. More on how the U.S. healthcare system is reinventing itself to address the Alzheimer's epidemic. Very good. The promise of new Alzheimer's drugs and what we can do to help prevent Alzheimer's and other dementias in our next reports. So as you can see, Alzheimer's is a tough disease. Um, it's tough for family members. It's really tough for the individual because you're used, you know, you've been an independent adult for so long, 
and it's so hard understanding or coming to grips with the fact that there are things you can't do or things you shouldn't do. So it's a really challenging disorder for the whole family. So, while Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, representing 60 to 80 percent of the cases, there are also many other kinds of dementia. Uh, the differential is important because they have different courses and treatments, so it's important to know which dementia you have. There's frontotemporal dementia. This involves loss of the frontal and or cell loss in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. Some typical signs are problems with language, changes in personality, and changes in behavior, especially impulse control issues. It's estimated that frontal temporal dementia accounts for about 20% of dementia cases. There are also deficits with executive functioning. However, memory is relatively preserved in frontotemporal dementia. There's also vascular dementia. This is a dementia caused by a vascular event, such as a stroke. It has a stepped progression, and the effects depend on the location of the vascular event. It can sometimes be tricky to differentiate from Alzheimer's, but the progression is a key differentiator between the two. Alzheimer's, you slowly but surely get worse. Uh, vascular dementia, it's more like a staircase, where you're okay, you're okay, boom. It's because you have a vascular event that leads to um, worsening cognitive problems. There's also dementia with Lewy bodies. It's a dementia that's associated with um, both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And it's characterized by the presence of Lewy bodies in the brain. Um, in Lewy body dementia, you have a loss of acetylcholine neurons like you have in Alzheimer's, but you also have a loss of dopamine producing neurons like what you see in Parkinson's. Thus, you have some loss of motor control similar to Parkinson's, um, but you also have some memory issues. So how do we differentiate? Alzheimer's disease has more of a gradual onset, um, whereas Lewy body dementia is more rapid or acute. It also progresses more quickly um, than Alzheimer's. Parkinson's disease also has Lewy bodies, and in its later stages can also result in um, cognitive difficulties. So, the actual diagnosis of, um, for most dementias can't be definitively made until after death. We're getting better with imaging to be able to tell, you know, tell some, but the definitive diagnosis is at autopsy. However, there are neuropsychological evaluations that can accurately determine the diagnosis, and this is important for creating an accurate treatment plan. So um, I can't show you too many of the instruments just because I don't want to invalidate them, but this is one that you can find online, so I don't mind showing you. Um, so this is a test called Trails B, and what you do is it's um, where you go, you start at one, and you go number, letter, number, letter in order until you reach the end. So you go from one to A, oop, lost my cursor, one to A, from A to you go to two, two you go to B, and so on until you reach the end. So this is just one neuropsychological test that we can use to determine the level of someone's functioning. And, um, we can use it to differentiate um, the different dementias. And again, that's important because a very different course. Um, for some dementias, say it's um, a vascular dementia, unless you have another vascular event, there's no reason to assume that things are going to get worse. Obviously, with Alzheimer's, ours, it's going to get worse. So it helps the family plan accurately and determine how to best manage um, manage the the dementia. So um, a couple benefits of evaluation. I'm a big believer in evaluation for individuals with dementia. Um, so one thing is it helps determine what an individual can do. So these are called capacity evaluations. So can a person manage their money? 
Can a person make medical decisions? Uh, things like that, trying to decide whether or not that person is able to do that or not. As I mentioned, it helps prepare the family for the future. Uh, giving advice um, about screening power of attorney documents, for example. A screening power of attorney is a power of attorney that only becomes in effect if the person is incapacitated. So what often happens is families wait too long and the, the individual with dementia doesn't sign off on a power of attorney until they're already incapacitated, at which point they're legally not able to sign off on a power of attorney. So a springing power of attorney can be a nice solution because it only goes into effect when that person is incapacitated. And it also reverts capacity back to the individual with dementia um, if their capacity is restored. So it's not that you're signing away your rights forever. You're just signing away your capacity to another decision maker if you are to become incapacitated and then they return to you um, should that un should that be undone should you recover we also can evaluate whether or not an individual should keep driving which is one of the biggest questions that people often have um, and also whether or not it's safe to live at home so a lot of things to factor in and to consider with um, dementia and so if you have an older adult, if you have a loved one that you think may have dementia, I really strongly encourage evaluation. Um, I think it's really important to know what you're dealing with, um, get that individual on medication usually, it depends on the dementia though, and, um, and just to kind of help prepare the family for what's to come. I think that's really important.